on today's World Insights. All systems go in carrying out COVID-19 mass vaccination in Russia, Britain, and soon the U.S. and EU. What are the hurdles and what do early vaccine results tell us? And with the rollout of highly touted vaccines in December, could they spell the end to the pandemic? Answers from Jerome Kim, the Director General of the International Vaccine Institute. These are exciting times by press release. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside with me, Tian Wei. We begin with the glimmers of hope in the race for the vast distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. Russia became the first nation to roll out its self-made COVID-19 vaccine last Saturday at clinics around Moscow. Following Russia, Britain's healthcare providers are gearing up to give the first doses of Pfizer vaccine. The move comes less than a week after British authorities approved it for emergency use on December the 2nd. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration is scheduled on Thursday to review Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine with German company BioNTech for regulatory approval. If approved, these vaccines could begin shipping throughout the U.S. in days. The EU and many other countries are expected to follow suit in the following weeks. With the consecutive mass distributions of vaccines worldwide, how to overcome logistical challenges in terms of vaccine storage and safety concerns? Let's turn to our panelists. For more on COVID-19 vaccine, joining us in New York, Vincent Racaniello, Higgins Professor at Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Columbia University. In Washington, D.C., Kate Tulenko, CEO of uh, Corvus Health. In Beijing, Ding Sheng, Institute Director of the GHDDI, and Dean from the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences with Tsinghua University. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program. A lot of new development regarding the vaccines. Uh, the UK has already started. Uh, its uh, vaccination to the vulnerable group. How much uh, can we expect from this latest rounds of vaccination in the UK? And what does it mean for everybody else? Uh, Ms. Tulenko. I think immediately in the UK, we'll start to see information on side effects and whether or not the side effect profile looks like what we saw in the phase three trials. And about a month to two months out, we'll start to get more data from the UK as far as any uh, effects of stopping the COVID transmission. I think that will be very closely watched. And we know that the U.S. hopefully next week will start to roll out the Pfizer vaccine. Some big challenges around the, the very cold temperatures, the minus 80 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. Also about the, the roots of whether um, the states will give the vaccine directly to nursing homes or whether it will go through CVS and Walgreens. So a lot of different things to sort out. Professor Racaniello, as we know, the third stage trial data, even when it's being made public, the data could help us to learn better about the vaccines. But when it's mass vaccination, uh, then things could be different, even from the third stage trial numbers. So what can we expect? Because this is quite urgency use. Now, we really don't have the luxury of waiting many years to do the proper testing. So we do the best that we can. We have nearly 100,000 people tested between the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines and no significant side effects. Certainly when you scale up to millions, I mean, that's an unprecedented number of people that we're gonna vaccinate all at once. We've never done that before. There's certainly gonna be other rare side effects, but uh, overall, it, it's always a, a risk assessment. Is it worth the risk to wait? longer or should we start stopping people from getting very ill from COVID-19? Mm. Now it's already started and therefore Professor Ding with China's uh, prevention and control doing relatively well still at this stage. What should be the strategy for China and the timetable if possible to plan? As you mentioned, just mentioned actually in China domestically, uh, actually we, we don't really have uh, much uh, 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 viral sort of infection um, uh, we only uh, we've only uh, been seeing sort of uh, a very uh, rare uh, sporadic sort of viral infection. Uh, so so in this uh, uh, in this sort of domestic context, actually, uh, whether uh, mass 
uh, vaccination is really uh, necessary or actually how this should be conducted uh, at different level actually uh, is really uh, an important uh, question. We should actually really monitor again uh, the, the, the vaccine actually safety and efficacy data over time and then really determine how, how this can, can be done. There will be a lot of logistic issues actually we have to closely watch. Mm. There are a lot of uh, vaccine candidates so far, at least uh, four. Uh, now we could also expect in the near future some uh, new uh, comers who might be joining the block, as they say. Uh, so what to choose, which one to choose, at what time to choose, what, what would be the advantage of one vaccine vis-a-vis -vis the others? Do we know at all, uh, Ms. Tulenko? So I think a lot of this has already been decided through the, the pre-market commitments that countries have made to pre-buying vaccines. So a lot of countries are already locked in. Yeah. But I think we will see more uh, vaccines coming on the market. We already have two MRA vaccines. We have a um, adenovirus vaccine. There's another company, um, Mayista Vaccines, that is creating a, a very sort of standard of attenuated virus vaccine, so live attenuated virus vaccine. Uh, that will actually have the coronavirus, the full coronavirus in it. And so I, I think that a lot of it will depend on how much companies can ramp up production and whoever can ramp up production faster and um, get it out most cost effectively may sort of win the race. But I do think we'll see a market with a lot of different vaccines available over the next few years. Talking about production, we have seen already some of the major vaccine candidates, uh, the pharmaceutical company behind it, uh, claim that they would only be able to produce uh, half of the amount they promised earlier for the rest of the year. Now, this is a critical time because we're rolling out to the massive population in different countries. So how do you see, Professor Recaniello, the commitment, capacity, and implementation of promises by pharmaceutical companies and what might be the factors that would have an impact on these issues? Well, as you know, we are trying to immunize 7 billion people. Yes. And in most cases, they're going to need two doses each. That is unprecedented. And the amount of vaccine or multiple vaccines, no one vaccine would ever be able to satisfy the entire world's needs. We need multiple vaccines from different companies. And even at that, at best, a company can make 100 million doses a year of a vaccine. And now we're asking them to make a billion doses a year. So many companies have had to scale up production to buy new plants and equip new plants, hire new people. But really, in my view, the most important thing is getting the raw materials mm -hmm. for the vaccines. And this has turned out to be a bit tricky. In particular for Pfizer, they said they couldn't get the raw materials that they needed to make. What are uh, the, the raw materials are we talking about, just for those who do not know your trade very well? Yes, the raw materials for the Pfizer and the Moderna max vaccines are the chemicals that are needed to make the RNA, and then the lipids that are used to encase yes. the vaccines. They're very unusual chemicals, and it's not something you can just go buy anywhere. Ms. Tulenko, we have seen the international governance structure regarding public health, for example, regarding WHO, has been quite fragile uh, from the U.S., particularly withdrawal from it, and still until January the 20s, you don't have a new president. So um, this is also a tricky time. So how can all of these factors that you all lightly touch on only earlier uh, be actually done uh, without a great structure governance structure? Well, the WHO does have its governance structure and it does have its, its global COVID program. And so I think you'll see a lot getting rolled out uh, through that. And most likely starting in January, the Biden administration will join that effort. But I, I do think that we will see many low income countries really struggle to get the amount of vaccine that they need and struggle to, to get the vaccine out to the people who need it. Uh, but, you know, also, I think an, an important thing to note is we probably will also see shortages of other vaccines. So for example, there was already a global shortage of the human papillomavirus vaccine, which is the cervical cancer vaccine. Mm. And as more and more vaccine plants, you know, sort of get turned over to producing COVID vaccine, uh, as several of the other speakers have mentioned, there's really a limited number of, of vaccine plants 
So as these vaccine plants focus on, on COVID, I think we will see more shortages of other vaccines. Professor Dean, we have heard from some developing and emerging economies that they are willing to be the local uh, manufacturer of certain vaccines that are already available and people pin big hope on. How would that work? Um, IPR issue, monitoring quality issue, and whether it will be a competition among various pharmaceutical companies. Uh, you know, this is a very interesting, intellectually interesting, but certainly a very challenging question right now, Professor. Uh, how actually this can be really uh, locally executed, uh, uh, it's actually uh, uh, really important. Uh, again, there, there are um, even actually applying, you know, uh, it's very complex, you know, applying the same manufacturing uh, procedure protocol yes. uh, and the sourcing materials, uh, uh, really having QC and also having a local regulatory agencies actually uh, monitoring uh, all the process uh, uh, granting sort of uh, uh, all the approvals actually uh, could be uh, could be really really complex. Mm. Professor Racaniello, same question. Well, even just within the U.S., we see every state has a different issue, and every state is going to get a different amount of vaccine. It's a, it's a microcosm of what's going to happen. Uh, in the rest of the world and how it's going to be distributed is going to be a nightmare. We have cold climates, we have hot climates that are going to impact the vaccine, keeping the cold chain. And then, as you say, if you want to manufacture it, most countries do not have the capability of manufacturing. So you have to build it from scratch and that requires people to teach you. So it takes away from other locations where people need to do the work. It's very, very difficult to, to decentralize that. Mm -hmm. You know, it'd be interesting to see, as you were mentioning, the, the local licensing of the vaccine, that we know that Morocco is in discussions with China to, uh, to license the, the Sinopharm uh, vaccine. So there'll need to be, you know, training and modifications of the, uh, the local vaccine manufacturing plants. Um, and, you know, we imagine that, that this type of treaty would be, or this type of uh, contract would be enforceable under WTO. But I, I also can't help but think that you might see some low-income countries do compulsory licensing, as was done with HIV treatments, where they mm. took a drug that was on patent and started producing it uh, you know, without paying the, the patent fees. That, that potentially might happen, I think, if we have uh, a too short a supply of the vaccine. Mm. Do you think uh, other commercial pharmaceutical companies, such as Pfizer, Moderna, and others, will be able to do similar uh, practices? The, the, um, the compulsory licensing, no, you, you won't see the major ones um, doing that because they, they will respect the, the, um, the patents. You'll see uh, generic companies in low-income countries doing that. I see. I'm not sure if we have actually already seen that, actually, for example, for remdesivir or, or other sort of a, yeah. a COVID sort of a, a treatment. But I think now, actually, we also have some sort of prior experiences and also new technologies. Uh, we have a lot of smart people, dedicated people, actually uh, thinking ahead uh, on those different issues. We're really sort of uh, um, uh, uh, learn as we sort of uh, uh, rolling this out. Uh, uh, again, I'm, I'm optimistic uh, mm -hmm. we can really uh, do this. Uh, I hope we could uh, be optimistic. Uh, Professor Recaniello, uh, even talking about the U.S. situation, 15 million, that's the latest number, and it's growing. If, uh, as reported by media around the world, that uh, in the United States, consensus is not there in regarding vaccines. What does that mean for the U.S. and what does that mean for prevention and control um, for the rest of the world? As you may know, part of the problem in the U.S. is that a good fraction of the population either doesn't believe that the virus is a problem, will not, will not take mitigation efforts like face masking and distancing, and that simply allows the virus to spread. Many people get together, including the administration, without masks and without any precautions. So it's hard to have a lot of sympathy for them. On the other hand, they do spread it to others who, who mean well. And so one can imagine similar sentiments extending to vaccination. There are already uh, rumors that many, many people do not want to take vaccines because they're worried that they've been rushed, that they're not safe, and so forth. And I think we need to have 
uh, celebrities get vaccinated on, on television, like Elvis Presley did for polio vaccine. Mm. And that would really help a lot. And I think if the president did that and so forth, it would help to allay some of the concerns. But I think it really is a big issue. And only as things get going, as we roll out vaccine to millions and millions of people, and we see that it's safe and it's beginning to push the numbers down, then I think more people will come along. And that's going to be a, a, a very a good thing. Well, I think uh, if the U.S. continues to have an outbreak because of the vaccine hesitancy and because of the refusal to wear masks and social distance, it will have an impact on the world economy. There, there are currently a number of countries that you know, are very heavily dependent on U.S. tourism uh, and also just U.S. business dealings. And yeah. as long as the U.S. continues to have an outbreak, it, it, it's really going to be a challenge. And I think that in the future, we might also see the, the U.S. continuing to, to spread covid to other countries. Some countries are now opening up to tourism because they, they economically have to. Mm -hmm. So uh, we see some challenges in the kind of, the, you know, when the U.S. sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold. If this continues to rise in such a sharp way, uh, there's also going to be a test for the vaccines and the speed of the vaccines, isn't it? Um, and the qualities of the vaccines and, and everything else. Uh, so uh, that, that's something, one thing. The other thing is uh, about wearing masks, for example. We have seen this doubts about wearing masks for half a year almost or even longer than that. And only at the end of the day when there's no other ways and things are getting really bad that there are compulsory rules in certain countries to do it. Now, sometimes it's too late, particularly in time of a pandemic. So how do we see you know, this urgency right now, uh, even though we have some dim hope with the help of the vaccine. Dr. Tulenko. I do think that some of the governors who really have been holdouts regarding masks uh, will finally uh, declare mask mandates. I think they'll just be forced to because they'll be at great risk of their hospital systems collapsing. A recent survey of physicians have shown that 4% of physician offices have already closed permanently and another 6% plan to do so in the next year. Uh, health workers are just exhausted and uh, I think that these very reluctant states really will be forced uh, uh, to, to close bars and restaurants down to have mask uh, mandates to prevent the collapse of their health system. Because even if you don't have COVID, a stroke, if you have cancer, right. you have a heart attack, if you're in a, a car accident, you cannot get proper care in many U.S. states right now because the hospitals are so overwhelmed. It's going to be a series of problems uh, as we talk about. Uh, Professor Recagnano, your take. As you know, the president-elect Biden has already said he would like to institute a nationwide mask mandate, and already many governors are saying no. And it's just unfathomable how public health can be conflated with politics. It's, it's just puzzling. I, I mean, I've never seen a pandemic of this magnitude. I've never seen interference with public health uh, from politics. And I hope we never have to go through it again because I think it made it much worse, frankly. And I, even though some governors are turning around, not enough will, and people in their state will die, sadly. Very sad. Professor Ding, your final take. We're still hoping, actually, the U.S. Uh, has, you know, the resilience, actually, to, to combat uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, again, sort of, uh, we're all learning from that. Uh, but the rest of the world also are, are, are doing uh, their parts, actually, uh, on controlling uh, the viral infection, certainly the, the, the vaccine, uh, vaccination uh, w with, you know, the, uh, the data actually coming out of those uh, different vaccine trials actually are, are really uh, hopeful. Mm -hmm. Vincent Recaniello, Kate Tulenko, Ding Sheng, thank you so much for joining us. All the best and be safe wherever you are. Thank you.